let me welcome you to the inaugural event in our renovated uh, conference center space. We're going to call this the Ray Nike Conference Center. Uh. Ray has been enormously uh, at the front, the forefront of putting together this total renovation of this space. The idea was to make it a modern, uh, state-of-the-art communications facility, so we're delighted and very delighted that Steve Brin will be our inaugural speaker in this space. This is our first uh, uh, colloquium for the spring semester. We had one actually scheduled previously, but that got canceled, and a visiting scholar couldn't, couldn't be here. So I'm Michael Nocht, interim director of the center for this semester, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Brint, who I think many of you know. He's a longtime friend of the center. He's a distinguished professor of sociology and public policy at UC Riverside. He's a Cal grad, go Bears. Hi, yeah, go Bears. And Harvard PhD in sociology. He's written several major books that have won all kinds of awards. The sociology of higher education is one of his fields. Uh, he's working on some very interesting new studies related to entrepreneurship in universities. He's a native of Albuquerque, and he's been back and forth at the center for many years. He's, he's one of the visitors who really visits and really provides feedback and is a true friend of the center. So we're delighted to have him here, Steve Brint. Thank you, Michael. Okay, it's great to be here. Um, and it's my third trip to the center this year, so it's been really lovely to have a chance to catch up with people here. Uh, today I am going to uh, talk about uh, the educational backgrounds, as you can see, of U.S. business uh, and political leaders. Uh, this is a new topic uh, for me. As sometimes happens in academia, I was invited to uh, um, a conference on elites, and I decided, okay, we, there's not been very many good studies recently on uh, the educational backgrounds of, uh, of business and government leaders, so I endeavored to change all that, and I want to just throw up this uh, table. Uh, Clearly, it's become a lot more competitive to get into elite colleges and universities. This just talks about the Ivy League. Comparing 87 to 2013, you can see how many more applicants there are, and you can see what has happened to the acceptance rate. Uh, at Stanford, actually, the acceptance rate is lower than Harvard now. It's about 5%. Uh, and what are, why are people going to these schools? Well, they're going for a lot of reasons, but one reason is because they create or they produce leaders. Let's see. Here are some mission statements that tell you uh, that this is part of their identity, that we prepare leaders. Uh, now, some of them actually have more truth in advertising than this, and they say, uh, we admit talented students and put them in a small community uh, and create thoughtful and, con and conscientious uh, um, uh, adults with good character. But a lot of them are clearly part of what they're doing. Part of what they're saying to the world is we prepare leaders. Um, and so this is not um, something I'm making up. It's still part of their core part of their identity. Now, wh what I wanted to do was just see, do they prepare leaders? Uh, I think that's our image, that's our stereotype. And I've had many people at places like Harvard tell me that the leadership stratum is very heavily composed of people who go to places like Harvard. Um, and they're quite proud of that. But uh, I was skeptical, and part of the reason that I was skeptical is a long time ago I did a study that looked at who's who, and I saw that there were a lot of people from public universities in who's who. Uh, and so that's one reason for skepticism. I also have been playing with ideas about sector differences, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna find, see that 
we say there's divided America. Well, there's divided America in the preparation of business leaders and government leaders as well. So these were the questions. This is not, here we go. Let me just talk about a few people who, um, who have contributed to the literature on this. And a lot of these people, uh, here's my, one of my favorite pictures of C. Wright Mills without a helmet, of course. Uh, C. Wright Mills was one of the first to say uh, there's a power elite in America, and that power elite uh, disproportionately comes from upper class backgrounds. Those people are educated at the elite institutions, especially the Ivy League, and they're recruited on into corporate management and government by people who are similarly educated and have similar backgrounds. Uh, and there are some other famous folks up here as sociologists. You'll, uh, you'll know these faces, Pierre Bourdieu and Anthony Giddens. Uh, they did studies of their own in France, and uh, one of Bourdieu's studies suggested that as many as 50% of the French elite come from the Grands Ecoles. Uh, 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 Giddens found in the most recent cohort he looked at, but this is pretty old, all this stuff is pretty old, um, that 42% that, uh, came from Oxbridge in, uh, in business and government. Uh, we're, we're getting now, uh, um, this is coming back a little bit. Uh, some of you may know the work of Lauren Rivera. Lauren Rivera looks at law, like corporate law, management consulting, and um, uh, what else was she looking at? This is, uh, and I think corporate management in um, for the first jobs, the first jobs of people coming into these uh, corporations, and she finds that a lot of them come from the Ivy League. And she says, it's kind of a, it's a similar argument. There's cultural matching. Uh, people feel like if somebody's come from an elite institution, they're up to it, they can produce. They themselves came from a, uh, these institutions. They're people that they would like to go skiing with or sit in an airport uh, waiting room with, and they, they feel an affinity, and so they hire them. The quantitative, uh, Neil Flickstein is here, and Neil, uh, Neil uh, contributed a lot to the early, some early studies of uh, recruitment into the corporate elite, but his question was a little bit different than mine. His question, uh, now you can correct me, Neil, uh, if I'm wrong about this, but he showed that different stages of the uh, development of American corporations, that the recruitment into CEO positions came from different uh, functions or different areas in the corporations, starting with entrepreneurs, then going to manufacturing, then going into sales, and then after 1960, finance. And that reflected the particular problems that corporations were having in those, in those eras. The, the quantitative studies uh, that, that um, I'm going to be in talking about in relation to are really about educational background, not about where they come from in the corporations. And uh, the folks who do quantitative studies, have done quantitative studies, have not found as much concentration as the elite theorists or, uh, or Lauren Rivera by implication. Lauren doesn't actually count, but she, by implication, she suggests that it's pretty high. Yes? Uh, when you talk Well, I'm. Or are you going to get into that? I will. Yes, I'm going to get into it. But it, it's undergraduate, graduate business, and graduate law are what I'm going to talk about. Those are the the main feeders. Um, so you see, in Carabell uh, from a study, for, uh, the 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 sample was in the late 1970s. They found about 30 percent had came from the top 11 undergraduate colleges. Another 20 percent came from the top nine business schools or law schools. Uh, so 50% altogether, if you look at both undergraduate and graduate. Uh, since that time, the f there's been, the quantitative studies have found fewer. Uh, uh, so more recently, Capelli, Hattori, and colleagues have found 10 to 15%. But again, just looking at the Ivy League uh, and another, another 
10% from graduate or so, maybe a little bit higher from graduate. This is a fellow who just looked at billionaires and, uh, and I guess they're getting to be enough billionaires that we can look at them. And he, uh, he, uh, he also didn't find quite the level of concentration that you'd expect from elite theory. Um, so there's some indications that um, maybe, maybe the elite schools are not preparing leaders quite as much as early theorists thought. Okay, so, uh, there we go. We, I found that, so, I found that uh, this, this uh, literature had some weaknesses. Uh, first of all, all the people who do quantitative studies use a small static set of institutions, mostly the Ivy League. Capelli is another who just focused on the Ivy League. Carabell and Newseem focused on 11 institutions. Elite institutions may be somewhat larger in number than that, and they may change over time as well. So uh, there, there's, there's reasons to believe that USC, for example, was not an elite institution 30 years ago, and now people might consider USC an elite institution. Uh, Duke might be another example. Uh, these studies also did not represent institutions at the proportion uh, that reflects the, pro the number of people who go to undergraduate school versus business school versus law school. So you have um, almost 100% have undergraduate degrees, but uh, maybe 50% of those folks have business degrees and a smaller percentage, about 30% have law degrees. So if you're looking at elite institutions, you sh I think you should have a proportions that reflect uh, the numbers of people who are coming out of these different areas. The industry divisions in these quantitative analyses were, um, reflect much older views of what industry looks like. So you have, for example, Yusim and Carabell talk about uh, wholesale trade, retail trade, finance, um, manufacturing, they're not, like we would now think about different sectors that uh, like energy and construction and, and finance and media and software. And so, uh, and similarly, Bourdieu and, and Giddens, uh, same kind of deal. They, Bourdieu looks at family firms versus large corporations. Giddens looks at um, banking versus all others. They're pretty primitive classifications of industries. And typically, government leaders are not considered. I think they should be. They, they can, you know, they're dependent on corporations, but they also set some of the rules by which uh, corporations live. We'll see if that continues. Uh, Okay, I'm probably pointing. Steve, why is it that government leaders haven't been part of this analysis? They say the Oxbridge phenomena is a major feature yeah. of all the elite positions in the UK. Yeah, yeah. The UK, Stanhope and Stanhope do talk about government leaders and. Uh, you know, it's it's a funny thing, John. I don't have any real explanation for it. There's just been a focus on business more than government. Um, and especially in the United States, that's been true. Um, okay, a few hypotheses here. Uh, I th one hypothesis is that there's a lot of industry variation. And I'm gonna give, I'm gonna throw up soon a two by two table which explains why I think what kind of industry variation there is. Uh, there's reasons to believe that graduate degrees are becoming the more consequential degree for corporate management. And now we have in our sample, which is about 4,000, two thirds of them have graduate degrees. 92% plus we could verify as having baccalaureates, but probably higher. Uh, as I said, we, one hypothesis that I had based on previous work was that public universities are pretty, the elite, like what John would call the public flagships are competitive. And then we might also expect that part of the reason why there's a waning of, of the influence of the Ivy League is because recruitment is more global now than it once was. So, so uh, I don't know whether you can tell which one is which. 
Um, but which is the public university? Anybody want to guess? Uh, so this is Yale, and this is Michigan, and they even look a, a lot alike. So, you know, the sociologists love two by two tables. So you, that's one of our occupational weaknesses. We really love that kind of thing. And so this is what I theorized, that industries are, are varied but on two dimensions. One is, do they employ a high proportion of uh, workers with advanced degrees? And I just used a 5% cutoff. Um, now, you know, because I, I was looking at a sample that goes, the people started in the 70s, and now you would actually have to use a 10% cutoff to get at um, these industries. It, just looking at 2015, or a low proportion of workers with advanced degrees. So here it's under 5%. Um, and then the other dimension is, do they manipulate symbols primarily, or do they manipulate the material world? Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that, I hope you'll agree that at least construction, food products, motor vehicles are manipulating the material world. Finance, media, internet, services, software, symbols. And these are, these are the mixed situation where you have, they do, they do employ a high proportion of people with advanced degrees, but they're mostly involved with the material world. Um, we can debate whether I've characterized these correctly. This is an empty cell. There is no industry that employs, uh, that, that manipulates symbols primarily and doesn't employ a lot of highly educated people. Why do they employ a lot of highly educated people? Well, because they're processing um, uh, a high volume of materials that require abstract and analytical thinking. Um, maybe technology is changing very fast in these industries. And so th they're, they're, um, the upper reaches anyway are very highly concentrated among people with advanced degrees. Okay, here's our sample. Uh, those are the 15 industries I looked at. Uh, government is included, and you'll notice I put government in this category of symbolic manipulation and lots of people with advanced degrees, or relatively many. Uh, almost 4,000, the industries were drawn on theoretical grounds, five in each of the three quadrants. And we looked at up to 25 ranked firms. Uh, for the government leaders, you can see who we included. And here's the breakdown of executives, there weren't many in apparel, um, but pretty healthy number. Now how did we define uh, in the others? There's a pretty healthy number. Uh, we allowed the corporations to tell us who their senior executives were. So- How far down did you go? Well, the, hot, the lowest was like senior vice president. Um, you know, sometimes they, they do it regionally, for example. They'll say the European region vice president, or sometimes they even call it president. Uh, this introduces a potential bias in terms of firms that want to list a lot of executives. But it is correlated with size. The, the, the correlation is about 0.25. The, the, the other way that to do this is just to take a constant number, which has a different bias. And the different bias is that it gives more weight to the smaller firms. So we didn't know quite how to do this. Um, either way, there's problems with it, but we let them define it. And there were a few far, large firms, just to be perfectly honest here, like Facebook lists five executives. Mostly, if it's a big firm, they list more executives. But there are a few that, that don't list many. Um, so uh, the categories are determined by Department of Labor? Uh, how did you get to these categories and identifying it? And are there, what about industries that are, as they used to say, vertically or horizontally integrated? Yeah, well, we had to, we, you know, we had to put together a few, um, a few. Di in some cases, we had to put together things that 
fit in different ca industrial categories, standard sure, industrial standard industrial codes. We, we aggregated them in a few cases to, to come up with, uh, with the things that fit. So, okay. so you might have aerospace plus national security in this one. Um, most of them are just are, are very straightforward, but here you'll see it's, it's software and hardware. So Dell would be in this and, and Apple. Uh, we, we felt like we had to aggregate in order to get some numbers that would allow us to make some, uh, some statistically valid conclusions. Okay, so how did we define the elite institutions? We relied on U.S. News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report from 1988 um, started with the top 25 national universities. And from 1999, I think it was 88 also, they had the top 25 liberal arts colleges. They started with business in 1990 and law in 1990. And we... we we wanted to keep the proportion. So you can see this is 18 is ha roughly half of 39, is half of 39 almost. And 14 is almost in the proportion of the law graduates to business to undergraduate. But what, what we couldn't do is have a, so what we did was we took every institution that appeared on this list every single year and called them elite. What we don't have is the early years in the series, which is like most of these, almost all these execs are between 35 and 65. And so the early years of, for the older execs, they're graduating from 73 to whatever, before, certainly before 88. We don't have a list for that, for that period. This list is correlated with other lists, but the other lists are very opaque about how they judge eliteness, and we just decided to stick with one. Um, and it, it, it didn't make sense to, to mix and match here. Uh, but the ones that we have, they're all familiar to you. These 39, actually they're on, uh, they're on the um, table, yeah, the table three, you can see. That, um, and then I compare them to the empirical top 37. The empirical top 37 are, uh, are a different set. The empirical top 37 are the ones that actually produce the most executives. Um, and there's some overlap, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so here's just what I said. Um, there's the limitation. We don't have data on top schools since we're relying on US News from the 1970s through 88, but we do have a good proportionality. We have about half as many business schools and there are about half as many, um, half as many execs who went to business school as, as finished their baccalaureates. And we have about, um, about the right proportions, a little high for law school, but pretty close. All these law schools, same deal. They, fit, they were on the, the list every single year. Berkeley is one. Berkeley uh, is not on the top 39 undergraduate, though, because it missed a couple of years. Um, but, um, OK, here are the variables we coded. Uh, in the tables, we just, these three we put together. Uh, general counsel, CFO, CEO. I think I left COO out here, apologies. And then all others, so these senior vice presidents and so forth are the others. Uh, we couldn't get race, ethnicity, or social class from the websites in a, in a way that was conclusive, so we couldn't look at those. Um, okay, so here are some findings. And you see if you think these are, this is a high concentration or not. Um, first thing I have to say, because there uh, this was the first thing the reviewer said was, okay, 18% doesn't sound like a lot, maybe, but they're five to, five to six times as likely to be in this executive group than you would expect by chance. So that's an advantage. Um, and there's no way of knowing whether actually 18% is high, low, or medium. It's, it's, 
you have to make that judgment for yourself. It's certainly a lot lower than Pierre Bourdieu and Anthony Giddens found for France and, and England. It's much lower than the early American elite theorists were suggesting. Well, they didn't, they didn't put a number on it, but you sort of get the sense reading them that it should be a high concentration. Um, the public flagships, some of the public flagships, and they're on that, that table, they were slightly more um, frequent producers of top executives than the privates. But, of course, they're much larger on average. So um, as, as a kind of relative, a relative amount, they don't compare. But in absolute numbers, they do compare pretty favorably. So second on the list, I think you'll see is uh, University of Michigan, University of Illinois is very high. And you can imagine some of the reasons why this is true. They have business schools, they have engineering schools. A lot of the privates do not have uh, business or engineering, certainly not at the undergraduate level. Um, One would assume there might be some regional factors as well. Yes, and I'm going to get to that, John. You've anticipated something um, that's true. There are regional factors. Uh, okay, so if you look at table four in the handout, you'll get you'll have the beginning of a sense of the sector variation. And just looking at the bachelor's degree here, there were these are, with one exception, these we adjusted this um, Bonferroni adjustment to see whether they were significant, and uh, it's there were t there was one that was not, which was. Aerospace and aerospace and entertainment, although it looks like there's pretty high difference, um, but you can see it, it, it's it more or less runs as I've hypothesized with a couple of anomalous findings. The anomalous finding one is uh, apparel has got a higher concentration of elite college graduates than um, you might expect. And that's otherwise it runs quite as I would have expected. I think apparel is because it's very concentrated in the East Coast to get to your comment, John. Um, business and law degrees don't line up quite as much. The only ones that do, first of all, the gaps are much greater. And the only ones that really do line up are internet services, entertainment, and finance are very high concentrated among elite business schools and law schools. Motor vehicles is low, construction is low, but overall it's not a tremendous, uh, tremendously good fit. But the undergraduate, when I was pleased, the undergraduates do fit pretty well. Uh, here's, just give you a sense, these are the top four producers in four, four of these sectors. You can see in energy, maybe not like, you, maybe you wouldn't you know, once you think about it, you wouldn't be surprised by this. Like, of course, Texas and Texas A&M and Colorado School of Mines. I think Oklahoma was fifth or sixth on this list. Um, no, I'm sorry about this slide got, this is off center, but Brown is under finance. Um, the only one that lines up as elite theorists would expect really as government is uh, exactly as you might expect. Uh, okay, this, I'm sorry about the alignment here, but I think you get the idea. Okay, findings on graduate degrees. A larger proportion had elite business or law degrees than had uh, undergra elite undergraduate degrees. And again, there are 18 business schools and 14 law schools. Um, but but so you're starting to get some support here, I think, for the, the idea that graduate school is becoming more central. Graduate degrees are becoming more central. Um, remember, 18% of undergraduates came from an elite, the elite 39. 44%, though, of those with graduate uh, business degrees came from the top uh, 18. And 37% with law degrees. So it's it's... To me, this says 
graduate education is becoming the place where elitism comes in. You can go to um, you know, a less elite undergraduate place and do very well there, and then get your graduate degree, which is the degree that you're hired on and uh, at an elite place, and that's, that works. Uh, okay, so here's the pathways, uh, which is the last page. But even saying that, you can see here the most common pathway in the, into these top corporate positions is non-elite college and no graduate school. The second most common pathway is non-elite college and non-elite graduate degree. So about 50% of the sample, a little over 50% of the sample, is one of those two pathways. Um, so I don't know whether you find whether you we should find that challenging for elite theory or not. Um, again, it's it's a little bit arbitrary what you decide is the cutoff. Is it you know is it the fact that fifty percent of these people who are in top corporate positions and government positions never set foot in an elite school? Is that against elite theory? Well, it may. It may be, or at least it's a bit challenging to elite theory. Uh, not too much support for, uh, for global recruitment. About one out of 10 had any degree from a foreign university. Um, that's almost certainly higher than in the past, although there's not good data in the past. None of the studies sh even talked about foreign degrees. Uh, um, so you can see this is on our radar screen um, only fairly recently. But uh, we might expect this will grow. And here's, um, this is, we'll get at your question about region, John. You, you can see that um, once you put region into these equations, uh, the sector differences are still there, but they're not, they're not as, um, not, not every one of these sectors lines up the way that you, that that I would have hypothesized. And region is a big factor. Region, um, so, so these, these are all corporate headquarters. So what I coded was corporate headquarters into six regions. And if you are, and the east is, the east coast is the, is the reference category here. And you can see every one of these regions is much less likely to recruit from, from elite institutions. This is just for undergraduates. But the same story is basically true for on the graduate business and law, uh, except the West Coast also becomes uh, um, more likely to recruit from elite business and law schools if they're located in the West Coast. Here it doesn't here it doesn't show up as uh, well. It shows up as as less likely, um, but it's not significantly different from the East for the graduate degrees, and you still see that some of these. Some of these sectors are, are lining up as, you know, as I predicted they would. Entertainment, uh, food products are low, automotive is low, internet is high. So you've got a relationship that is including both the sector and the region. And region, region you, you just, uh, you have to say they're, both of these things are important and also these top positions are more likely to be from elite institutions than the senior vice president level. Okay. Uh, business and law, less conclusive about industry sector differences. It's still the case that a few sectors show a real distinctiveness, but the, they tend to be just three, finance, entertainment, and, uh, and software. And at the low end, it tends to be just construction, or just, uh, I'm sorry, just uh, um, automotives and, and food are less likely to recruit from, significantly less likely to recruit from the, from the uh, elites. Okay, so region continues to show significant associations, and the top positions continue to show associations and gender continues not to be significant. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk about a few conclusions from, uh, from this, uh, and then we'll have some, some questions, uh, I hope. 
I think the first conclusion is um, elite schools do produce some leaders. They certainly produce leaders at a rate that's higher than chance by quite a bit, but maybe it's a little lower than we might expect from previous studies. Uh, and it could be that going to an elite private institution is more about social status insurance. That is to say, not falling out of the upper middle class. Most of the people who, you know, and we know this from other studies that um, business executives are not necessarily sending their kids to elite private universities at an incredibly high rate. Most of those students at those universities are a lot like people in this room. They're highly edu their, their parents are highly educated professionals. A lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers, a lot of professors. And so you could say they're not producing leaders to the degree that we might have thought, but they're, they're probably creating a kind of status, uh, an insurance against status loss for most of these students. A public university cannot do that to the same degree. Just because it's much larger and it's, some of those kids are not gonna succeed in a public university. A lot of them do, obviously, but the range of their outcomes is just, a lot greater. Uh, so that's number one. And then, you know, when as, as I was thinking about this, I was wondering why did elite theorists ever think that there was this tight relationship? Because the selection criteria for getting ahead in business and government too, for that matter, and the selection criteria for getting into an elite uh, college are so utterly different. I mean, they're really utterly different. You have to, I mean, there's, so, you know, there's probably some affinities here, but look at what the selection criteria are for getting into an elite college. You, high SAT scores, you need to be able to master complex symbolic media, conscientiousness and studies, outstanding extracurricular and often service uh, volunteerism accomplishments. Admissions um, preferences are also made for people who fill in s things that the college needs, like tuba players and athletes, swimmers. Um. Senior executive positions, uh, Neil um, uh, studied this a lot more than I have. Uh, here's a list of things that are often considered to be important in moving up uh, in, uh, in corporate structures, and it's probably true of government to a large degree, too. Uh, some people uh, have, sh have said that e extroversion and, and uh, willingness to take risks are also important in moving up in, in corporations. Uh, we don't necessarily see elite college students as being incredibly uh, risk tolerant. I, I mean, maybe some of you will d disagree with that, but I think that they're pretty concerned about the things like their grades and they're not willing to even take challenging classes if it's gonna affect their grades. Uh, that's my observation. So, so the selection criteria for these two spheres seem to me to be extremely different. And, uh, and so I, you, you wonder, why is it that we ever thought they necessarily went together? And then, uh, the other finding here is, you know, again, a kind of about America di divided. That not only do we have very large regional differences in the recruitment of executives, um, whether they come from elite colleges or not, and elite graduate schools, um, there are sectoral differences. Um, and some of these sectoral differences, to me, have an affinity with what we're seeing in the country politically, the, the fact that you, you've got these industries that are manipulating the material world, that are building things, automobiles, um, harvesting food, construction, I'm willing to bet that those are also industries where there are a lot of conservatives in the top uh, ranks. And these other industries, um, certainly we have the stereotype of media as being liberal, um, Software, you know, you you know, I was the only. I went to Stanford uh, not long ago. I was the only person who had a, a suit coat on. You know, there's a certain liberalism in the 
in the air there, um, and you can see what some of the co the companies they're they're mixed, you know, they're mixed, but they're they're uh, some of them are coming out against some of the policies that we're seeing in government now. Uh, media finance um, don't know about finance exactly, but. At least it's a hypothesis that there's a affinity between industries that where you're manipulating complex symbolic media and intellectuality and more liberal politics on the one hand and industries where you're manipulating the material world um, and maybe less intellectually intense uh, and more conservative politics. Hypothesis, I make no conclusions there, but it's possible. And then finally, it could be the case that elite colleges nowadays are really much more about future writers, artists, thinkers, professors, scientists, the cultural elite, you might say, rather than the business elite. They still are disproportionately uh, contributing but maybe the concentrations, if you looked at these other more cultural occupations, you would find higher concentrations. I suspect that's true, but I don't have the data to show it. Okay, that's it. So uh, let, me, uh, let me ask for your questions. Yes. Okay, so I'm not sure I There are, oh sorry, there are like three or 4,000 colleges in this country putting out vast numbers of students. Uh -huh. oh, I think we can hear you. It's oh yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, the fact that 50% of, um, have 50 of the leaders have come from some elite institution is astonishing considering the number of students who come from other uh, educational settings? Uh, it's, it's about 30%, but, uh, but it still doesn't vitiate your point. Um, definitely, when we're talking about um, recruitment into these positions, we're not talking about the entire sweep of higher education. And even when I well, say but that- But a lot of these pe people, executives don't come right out of the educational institution. They come up through the ranks and their educational institution may or may not be important at all by the time they're ready to be the CFO. True, yeah. okay, uh, that, that's true. Uh, but let me say, this is really, I think this is really interesting that 50%, uh, 30% 30%. Have, have had a foot in an elite institution is, yeah. I think is quite Maybe astonishing. Maybe that's high, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's plausible that that is a high number. Yeah, can I follow up on that yeah. with a slightly different take on that? Um, so one of the things I did do once was study what happened to uh, um, graduates of Harvard Business School. And, uh, and one of the things is if you look at a, um, a much smaller sample of companies, they are much more highly represented. And so I'm wondering is you have a lot of companies here, and I, I understand your strategy is to take a broad uh, swath of all this. But if we were talking about the, the peak of the peak, um, that, for example, when you had on your CEOs, um, uh, there, was a, there was a distinct peak there. So if we were only saying like Fortune 500 or Fortune 50, would we then find that, um, that coming from Harvard uh, Business School or Stanford Business School, um, and then we would see that, that more of that elite effect? Well, we put rank in, and rank, we recoded rank, uh, Neil, into, one to 294. So uh, we had 294 firms, and they come from all over the Fortune 1000. So we recoded it, and rank didn't really improve fit at all. Uh, now, it's possible, I suppose it's possible that if we just did the study on the top 50, we'd find something. Um, it'd be interesting to look at. And, I, and actually, people have said this to me, that you're not looking at the real national firms. Like, and then people have, not something you're saying, but other people have said to me, well, yeah, but energy's not you know, a, a real national, a national instant, uh, industry, which I don't agree with at all. I mean, all of these, uh, you know, the energy business is a hugely important part of the economy. So uh, like, 
I don't, what I don't think you can do is just cherry pick certain industries and say they're the real, the real uh, important ones, like software. That's what's really important. Well, it may be that software is growing faster than most of these others, but they all play a role in the economy. Um, and I haven't looked at the top 50. It would be interesting to see. And just to just also to go back for a second to the other question. Yeah, there are 5,000 colleges and universities, and executives come from a very much smaller uh, set of those. The, the, the only reference point that I really have is elite theory. And maybe elite theory is just kind of crazy, because unlike France, we have so many more colleges. They're so spread through the country. Um, we also have many more businesses than uh, I'm guessing than in France, even per capita. And you know, it's it's just a much more heterogeneous situation. So we probably should expect looser connections, if only for that reason. So I just want to recount an interesting uh, uh, story that stuck in my mind. Uh, when one of the initial uh, NRC studies was done on graduate programs, uh, the chemistry departments were ranked 1 through 36. And people said, why are this number 30, 136 putting out PhDs? What do we need this these PhDs for? And the, the dean of that school chemistry department said, the students who are graduating from my institution are filling positions in our local area and are mm -hmm. doing a, filling a big need. And I thought, well, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that kind of squashed my thinking about the elite theory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not arguing that we should get rid of colleges and universities uh, just because they don't uh, put people in top corporate positions. That's, uh, but yeah, uh, they, often it, regionally they are very important. You were, you were um, asking about, um, talking about other kinds of, kinds of theories. Well, you know, there's this stuff that came out a couple of weeks ago, this uh, guy Chetty who, yeah. down at Stanford, um, which supports sort of what you're saying here, that the uh, universities and colleges, there are a lot, because, because of the regionalization of the economy and what you're talking about, that do a really good job in promoting people, particularly from lower socioeconomic groups into higher so mm -hmm. socioeconomic groups. And so that might be another place to anchor your argument that isn't just, so you have an alternative to elite theory, which is um, uh, coming from that work. I don't know if you've read that paper, but yeah, it's, it's uh, out there that the, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, I think it, it supports what you're saying, that um, there is more heterogeneity because um, there are all these regional schools that do a pretty good job, particularly for people who come from a lower socioeconomic yeah, background. Yeah. So I think that, that, you know, that fits your story, I think. Yeah, you know, I think the diversity of the economy today and say 50 years ago is so dramatic. Like I, I have looked at, fi oh, I have looked at, uh, it's been a while, but figures like, I think you know, according to the Department of Labor, you know, there's certain industries that are called high tech and now the auto, auto industry is included because of robotics. But about 11% of employment is in high tech businesses in some form. And uh, if you look at the distribution, while well, we have this notion that it's all, you know, sitting in Seattle or here in Silicon Valley or a few other places, it's actually much more diverse mm -hmm. and spread out. Getting to, back to there, there are really small companies that are existing in Iowa or other places. So I, I just that aspect of of the employment and what is a lead or not, it seems that the diversity of the of the economy has changed dramatically that that kind of old structure of what is the elite industries and who are the elite in leading those is perhaps outmoded. Uh, I think if you were to ask people at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, uh, is, is elite theory outmoded? I don't think you're going to get a yes on that. That's our business model. <laughs> uh, but, but that doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means that I'm... I'm, 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 I think that we maybe have uh, the overhang of something that was truer in the past isn't really as probably as true now. And, the, and maybe with that exception, if you looked at the top 50 um, companies, could be true. And we need to start thinking about it differently. Like not only, not only what are these private institutions doing, but 
how are we recruiting into top management? I think both of those things we need to look at differently if we don't have the kind of idea that um, there's a transmission of, of status. Uh, if that's not true, if there's sectoral variation or there's regional variation or there's different, or, or institutions fit into different ecological niches, as you were suggesting, then we need to have a, di a, a different and better theory of what's going on. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, and I also wanted to add, on that note, um, you know, thinking about Armstrong and Hamilton's contribution to a, a better understanding of the process by which status is transmitted and a lot of these industries not having meaningful entry-level positions. Certainly, I, I, I wonder if in the, the, the cultural sphere, you know, you, you, you have to be supported externally for multiple years before you're likely to have the sort of job that would pay you enough to live in a city. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and this is a uh, I, I just looking at these industries, I can't in my mind guess at which ones would have meaningful entry level, sustainable jobs. Right. For people who are not externally supported. But I imagine some will have lots of those. Some will have very few. Um, and I, I just I wonder if that would. I have no data yeah. about that. Uh, I think all of them have entry level jobs. Uh, there's a lot of circulation of executives from firm to firm and, and even from industry to industry. So, you know, the difference between entry level jobs and the folks that, that are at these executive levels is there's a lot of water under the bridge but between entry level and, and a lot of these folks have proven themselves in situations that um, where they've had just increasing levels of responsibility and they've done well in those increasing levels of responsibility. That's typical. Um, and, 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 and even Lauren Rivera sh shows that a lot of the people are recruited into law and management consulting and uh, these other industries that are highly, that come from Ivy League institutions, they often leave after two years because the, 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 the work is so boring. Uh, uh, somebody, somebody, yeah, no, it's working with spreadsheets on stuff that is really not that complex. So they get, they get that experience, they've been hired by a good firm, and then they go off and do something else very often. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they start their own businesses and forge other connections, um, but it's just, you know, it's I, very, probably few, and this we obviously haven't looked at either, but you might know, Neil, uh, whether people, um, I doubt that they stay with the same firm um, throughout their lifetimes. It's pretty uncommon. So it's, it's but the, the, the contacts that you make within the first firm are important. And they, and, and also sometimes at school. What, just a little factor here is that we see like these clusters of people, say, from the University of Miami in you know in a firm at the top level of the firm and my surmise is that this is a cluster of people who knew each other in a fraternity or interacted with each other or maybe they were friends of friends but um, it's just the chances of there being five of the top you know whatever 15 executives in a firm being from the University of Miami isn't just isn't that high unless that's like a chain mobility type of thing where they come together from from the university and they found, maybe even founded the firm and you know did well so Michael a couple of brief anecdotes which is slightly counter to your thesis just just with respect to the Harvard Business School All right. 30 odd years ago I was teaching at Harvard in the Kennedy School and the power of the business school was so gigantic. Let me give you a couple of examples. At one point, Derek Bach, when he was president of Harvard, stipulated that he was the final decider on all tenure cases, but not for the Harvard Business School. Yeah. The dean of the Harvard Business School was the final decider. Bach said that's unacceptable. From now on, they have to report up to him. So the Harvard Business School faculty met and then, uh, I think his name was MacArthur, who was a famous Harvard Business School dean, reported to Bach. 
at the Harvard Business School, which at that time had an operating budget that exceeded the GDP of any Central American country, would, would formally file papers to secede from Harvard University. And as you know, it's physically across the river. It has this huge complex of buildings. It would formally secede from Harvard and become a separate freestanding entity if he continued to pursue that. And he backed off. He backed off. Uh, at that I time- I don't know whether the Charles River Business School would have had the same- <laughs> well, At that time, at that time- the Formerly Harvard Business School. Yeah. At that time they claimed, because I remember something, like the Dow 30 Industrials, right? The top 30 at that time, which of course this is, predates the entrepreneurial Silicon yeah. Valley stuff. The, it's the 80s that two-thirds of the CEOs were Harvard MBAs, two-thirds. And they claim that in every walk of corporate life, every major corporation of any consequence had a Harvard MBA as the CEO, not down below. Now also, there are a couple of other issues I just want to mention. One is that there were debates even in the Harvard Business School at the time, are we doing this right and creating the leaders of tomorrow? Or are these people who are gonna be the leaders of tomorrow whether they go to the Harvard Business School or not? Because uh -huh. many of these students come from the wealthiest families in America. They are themselves the children of CEOs of top corporations. So it's not a matter of going in and doing spreadsheets and all that. They're, I mean, Jared Kushner was going to be the CEO of Kushner, whether he looked at the spreadsheets or didn't, once his father stepped down. And this was true across the nation in top corporate firms. Now, once the entrepreneurial aspects of Silicon Valley developed, Stanford Business School became a huge specialist in that area and I think has really completely outmaneuvered Harvard in the development of these, this entrepreneurial spirit. But I would bet still, it would be one, wonderful to have you give the same presentation at Harvard Business School and see what they think. I think you might, well, might have a different They would view. have a list of but people yeah, who have yeah, done well, very and yeah, well. This is just a sure. tiny, you know, <laughs> this is just a tiny subset. I'm talking about only one school, Harvard, which yeah. by the way they claimed there was no other business school of consequence in America yeah, that, other than Harvard that, Business School. That's that empirically not true because right. Warden was nearly as, if I remember, but only the data, in primarily really in finance, close. not in maybe in but real estate, in not in in corporate America. Um, anyway, yeah. it's uh, th those ideas were emblazoned in my mind. The the power it was like the Roman Empire. <laughs> Uh, or IBM before the PC. Well, uh, uh, and maybe those days are gone, but that was the self-perceived okay. view at that time. Uh, okay. well, so I'm just, I've just got the numbers, and I'm sure that if I went to Harvard, they would give me, a, like I said, a long list of people. Right. But, so let's look at it. Um, there's, there's fit, Let's see, 66% of these people in the sample got a graduate degree of some sort. 50% of those who got a graduate degree got a business degree. So I don't know what we're at, but we're at something 30, 40%. And of those, 44% were from an elite, one of the top 18. So we're getting to a small number. In that, whatever it is, 15 to 20%, uh, you've got a lot of people from Harvard, it's true. But you also have a lot of people from Warden, you have a lot of people from Columbia, I can't remember the top four. Chicago was pretty high, Stanford, Stanford was high. Harvard is, you know, no doubt is the top. Right, uh, like in law, well, Yale is a huge competitor to Harvard School. Yeah. So in fact, you may argue Yale is superior to Harvard yeah. School in some way. In the business school, Yale opted out, only in more recent years, how they created the School of Organization yeah. Management, which doesn't compare in cloud finance or any other way to Harvard Business School. Yeah. I mean, Harvard yeah. Business School doesn't know that Yale's Business School exists. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm prepared to. This I'm, is the reflection I'm, of their attitude. Maybe, now, maybe it's not. I'm prepared to definitely to believe it, Michael, but I still think you're going to find in this sample under 5% have a Harvard Business School degree. I mean, that's, I'm just doing sort of yeah. back of the envelope calculations. But of the top companies? Well, that, so that's, you know, that could be an issue. That's a big issue. That could be, a, that could be an issue. Harvard doesn't care who's the CEO of, uh, 
Joe's cleaning show. Well, if, you, if we're able to look at parental education background and all those kinds of things, you could take a look at that. That's impossible to do. Yeah. So what about like in an environment in Germany? I know that in Germany, that the uh, CEOs have a very high percentage of, doc, of, of CEOs with doctorates. Um, and there's some kind of cultural uh -huh. aspect that relates to the German uh, environment for business. And then there's a lot of scandals as well, but the uh, CEO is getting PhDs with uh, dissertations that were not necessarily uh -huh. uh, original. But any thoughts the, on that? Well, there are a few who in America who have PhDs too, but they're pretty rare. Yeah. And I have heard that that is true of Germany, but I don't have any data about it. Um, it's much more common there, I believe, than it is here. And but I I don't I don't know. I, I can't say anything more than that. Well, there is a difference in the structure of, for example, business schools are a relatively new conceptual idea. Yeah. Was an undergraduate degree. But as I understand it, I get it probably depends on the diversification of the industries or the kinds of industries that they have. A lot of them are in STEM fields. And uh, I thought I heard something like 37% or something. Have doctorates. Yeah, it's a really mm. crazy wow. number. Wow. In business. I, 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 wow. Right. Well, this has been a fascinating presentation. Yeah. Lots of food for thought. Please welcome and thank Professor Brent. Thank you.